In Jesus' name, amen. amen. From Philippians chapter 1, begin reading at verse 18b. Paul writes, yes, and I will rejoice. Thank you for one amen. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live, for to me to live is Christ. And to, God, and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. The word of the Lord is blessed. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Um, for these next few moments that we have together, I would like to title our sermon from this passage, And Will Rejoice. <laughs> and Will Rejoice. A little over 40 years ago, on a balmy October Saturday afternoon in Madison, Wisconsin, a very odd occurrence broke out as the University of Wisconsin Badgers football team were hosting the Michigan State Spartans football team in Madison, Wisconsin. On that Saturday afternoon, in 1982, these two teams were playing just like these two teams would be playing in about two hours or an hour and a half. As I saw somebody's jersey. They, 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 they ready. <laughs> but these two teams, the University of Wisconsin Badgers, were hosting Michigan State in the afternoon of 1982 on this October Saturday. And this stadium was packed with crazy fans ready to cheer on their Wisconsin Badgers. However, it became obvious to those 60,000 Badgers fans that Michigan State was the far superior team that day. They were starting to beat the bricks off of their Wisconsin University football team. They were literally getting pummeled by Michigan State. That's why it was so odd and it was so confusing to the Michigan State team and the Michigan State fans that were in the stadium when they heard that as the game started to get out of hand and more and more lopsided, they were hearing the fans of the University of Wisconsin making joyous noises. And they started hearing them burst into loud celebration sounds of joy when their team was losing on the field. They were getting beat badly on the field, but yet their fans were in the stands celebrating. They were making sounds of joy and celebration like they were winning. They were turning to each other, get, slapping each other high fives and, and just so happy, even though what was in front of them did not look like what they were hearing from these fans. And so the Michigan State opponents, they were kind of just befuddled. They were confused, trying to figure out what is going on. How could this be? It turned out that 80 miles away, due east of Madison, Wisconsin, there was a baseball game going, out, going on in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The Milwaukee Brewers were in game three against the St. Louis Cardinals in the 1982 World Series. And back then, they didn't have cell phones or anything like that to check the scores. And so they were listening to transition radios in their ears. And even though the Wisconsin Badger University football team was losing on the field, they could hear that 80 miles east, 
their Milwaukee Brewers team was winning the World Series game they were playing in. Although what was in front of them wasn't very pleasant and wasn't the outcome that they had hoped for, they were still rejoicing and they were still celebrating because they were not responding to what was going on in front of them. They were responding to something that they, was, that they were hearing 80 miles away. As we've been navigating through this first chapter of Philippians over these past few weeks, what we've been trying to lift up for us to see is in this series of rejoicing in the Lord always is how what's happening around us does not have to determine whether or not we rejoice. Because our reason for rejoicing isn't because of what we see happening around us all the time. Joy Rejoicing consists of an internal stability in spite of external circumstances. And so we can rejoice even when things around us may look bleak. Even when it looks like you're losing, you can rejoice because we know that God is doing something even when we can't see it. We're able to have internal stability in spite of the external circumstances that we're looking at. And I'm telling y'all, when we do that, when we rejoice, not because of what's happening around us, because of the internal stability that we have, we confuse and defeat the enemy. We put the enemy on notice because when we can learn to rejoice in the Lord always and will rejoice in the Lord always, it confuses the enemy because what the enemy is hoping to do is that those trials, those tribulations, those difficulties, that situation that makes you feel defeated, that situation that is uncertain, you don't know the outcome. He is trying to use that to get you to shut up. He's trying to get all of those things to make you doubt God, not trust God, and not give God the praise. And so when you decide to rejoice and will rejoice, you confuse and you defeat the enemy because what he was trying to accomplish, he no longer can accomplish because he's not going to steal your joy. See, the enemy thinks that he can use those things to cause us to feel defeated. But when we respond rejoicing in those moments, the enemy has no choice but to shut up. Because he doesn't know what to do or say at that moment. Wait a minute. I have bombarded them with all of these things. And they're supposed to, they're supposed to walk away from God. They're supposed to doubt God. They're not supposed to be at church on Sunday morning praising God. They don't know how this situation is going to end. What are they doing? It confuses and it defeats the enemy. When we decide to rejoice in the Lord always and will rejoice. See, he's intended that what is happening to you will defeat you, will make you feel helpless, will make you feel hopeless, will make you despair. And when that's not happening, he has nothing else he can throw at us. So my prayer is that as we finish this year out, I know that for some of you, this has been a tough year. It's been a challenging year. It's been a year of bad diagnosis, sickness, loss, pain, difficulty, suffering. Some of you are in an uncertain situation right now. You don't know how it's going to play out, and you don't know how it's going to end. But as we end out this year, I want this word to encourage you to rejoice in the Lord always. 
Because just like those Wisconsin Badger fans, we can't let what we see keep us from rejoicing because we know God always has the final say. See, if we're not careful, we can allow our current predicaments and circumstances convince us to feel defeated, convince us to feel that victory can't come out of this, convince us to feel that we can't be delivered, we can't have any deliverance out of this. That deliverance and victory is not even in the realm of possibility. That's what can happen if we're not careful. But as we close this year out, I want us to close rejoicing. Not because of what we see, but because of what we know and who we know God to be. If you were here last Sunday, Pastor T broke it down for us when she told us how Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. When he wrote this letter, He was literally in prison 800 miles away. The Wisconsin Badgers, they were 80 miles from Milwaukee. But they are 800 miles away from Paul when he is writing this letter. And they don't have a transistor radio to be able to get word from Paul right away. And so they're waiting, they're worried, they're concerned. What's going to happen to our pastor, Paul? We know he's in prison and we don't know what this prison stance is going to stint is going to do. We don't even know if he's going to make it out of this alive. But 800 miles away, Paul sends word to them and he's letting them know that even though I am literally shackled to a prison guard to make sure I don't escape, I don't want y'all to think that. What's happening around me is going to keep me from rejoicing. That just because as I'm writing you, I'm literally having to pull on the prison's guard's arm because we're shackled together and he doesn't want me to escape. I don't want you to think that even in this predicament, I'm not going to find some reason to rejoice. He's not rejoicing because he's in prison. He's rejoicing in spite of the fact that he's in prison. He's not saying, oh, I'm so happy to be locked up. No, that's not what he's doing. But he's saying that in this moment, I can rejoice. The first reason he says is because I'm rejoicing because even though I'm 800 miles away from you and I'm in prison, I know that God started a work in you, Philippi. Y'all believers at the church at Philippi, I know God began a good work in you. And I know that if he began a good work in you, that he is going to make sure that it is finished in you. And so he's rejoicing because he knows that God is not finished working in you. Matter of fact, he he prays that God would continue to work in you because he knows what God is going to do through them. But he also is rejoicing because even though he is in prison, he is bound in prison. The gospel is not bound. That's what Pastor Tanya told us last week. The gospel is still advancing. And so he keeps the right focus because even though he's bound, he knows the gospel is not bound. And because the gospel is not bound, even though he might be bound, he's rejoicing that gospel is still being preached everywhere. Matter of fact, he's like he's saying it might be that my imprisonment has actually helped to advance the gospel. He's like, people are preaching that did not preach before, and they're probably preaching for the wrong motives, but I don't even care. I'm just happy that the gospel is being preached in advance. That's what he says um, in in verse number 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Y'all, he is finding reason after reason after reason to rejoice, even though he is in prison. Paul is saying that whatever my circumstances are, I still have reason to rejoice. Y'all are growing. The gospel is advancing, and there is reason to rejoice. He is 800 miles away, and his rejoicing in that jail cell gets other guards saved because they're trying to figure out how it is that he could be in such a good mood even though he is locked up. And he gets to tell them about Jesus Christ and they get saved. He confuses the enemy yeah. because of his rejoicing. They, 
they get set free from the bondage of sin even while he is still bound in shackles. Listen, Paul is helping us out, y'all, helping us to see that if we're not careful, our circumstances can make us think that God can't work it out, that we would feel defeated, that we would feel like deliverance is not possible. But Paul is saying, nah, even though we see some things happening around us, we don't have to feel defeated. And we can know that deliverance is still a possibility. As we continue to follow along in Paul's letter, in verse 14, he is pointing us to another thing that he is rejoicing over. And we need to slow down and see and notice how he is shifting in the middle of verse number 18. Now, it's tricky for us because we have these numbers um, sections and we think that, um, you know, you, you got it. You can't start, start in the middle of a verse. Well, actually, Paul is shifting his thought in the middle of this verse. He says, and in that I rejoice. And then he says, yes, and I will rejoice. The original language, he's actually shifting his attention to something else that he's about to bring to their attention that they should that he is rejoicing about. He is saying he's rejoicing that Christ is proclaimed in spite of him being in prison. But then he says, yes, I will rejoice for something else. The New King James Version says it this way, and it's the reason why I entitled the sermon the way what I did. The New King James Version says in verse 18 this way, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. (laughs) I, I love this because I love the indignant, confident way Paul is saying, and will rejoice. Like, like ain't nothing going to stop or hinder my praise. It's like he's standing 10 toes down and standing, saying, I, I will re- and, and will rejoice. No matter what comes, I will I, and I will rejoice and will rejoice. Somebody look to your neighbor and say, and will rejoice. He, he has this holy confidence. This righteous indignation to say, enemy, you might be showing me something right now where I feel and I would think that I'm being defeated, but I'm not going to let you get the victory off of this one and will rejoice. I rejoice over that. I rejoice over that. And I'm going to rejoice over this because I got plenty of reason to thank God and to rejoice. Paul does not like the fact that he's in prison, but he's not going to let prison keep him from rejoicing. He's like, I got too much to rejoice about. And even though what I'm going through may not look great, and will rejoice. Sometimes we just need to tell our enemy, our enemies, I rejoice and will rejoice. You might confuse your enemy if you rejoice even in the midst of what you're going through. I'm not going to let stuff happening around me make me succumb to the feeling of defeat. But I'm going to rejoice. Paul's confidence comes off, comes across in this first movement of the text that's found in verses 19 through 20. And we see that Paul has a confidence about deliverance. He is confident about deliverance. Notice this in verses 19 through 20. He says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul has this confidence of deliverance. But it's not clear what that deliverance is going to look like. That word deliverance there in the original language, it actually can also be translated salvation. And some, some um, Bibles translate it salvation. And, and what the scholars tell us is that Paul is perhaps being ambiguous about the terminology that he is using because he's trying to say, I don't know how this is going to end, but I know it's going to end well. 
It's going to end in something that involves salvation or deliverance in some way or another. I might not be delivered from jail, but I'm going to be saved even if I'm not delivered from jail. Paul has this confidence that he doesn't know the outcome of this situation. It's uncertain. It's not clear. He doesn't know how it's going to play out, but he is still confident that he's going to be delivered out of all of it. He's confident that he's going to get salvation out of all of it. He is confident that God is going to take care of him through all of it. Paul, if his trial does not go well, will probably get executed and die. He's not sure what's going to happen when he goes to trial. It could end in death. But he still says he has this confidence that this will turn out for my deliverance. And I love two of the things that he says that he knows why this is going to turn out for his deliverance. He says, because y'all praying for me and I got the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Listen, you think your prayers don't matter, but your prayers matter because not only should we pray, not pray for ourselves, but we need to pray for one another because somebody's deliverance depends on your prayer. Isn't that why we sang my mama prayed for me, my daddy prayed for me. We need somebody else to pray for us sometimes because sometimes you can't get a prayer through for yourself. And so we all need to be committed to praying for one another because your prayers have power just like my prayers have power. And there is this there is this this inter interdependence that we see Paul is bringing out here is that he is the apostle Paul, the pastor Paul. But he is still saying, I need your prayers and your prayers are going to make sure that I get delivered. I got your prayers and I got the help of the Holy Ghost. And if I got those things working on my side, then I know this is going to end deliverance, even though I may not know how it's going to end. I know it's going to end in deliverance. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that before where you didn't know how it was going to end. It was, it was uncertain. It is uncertain. You don't know the circumstances. What, what will one plus two lead to? You're hoping it leads to three, but it may lead to negative one, and you just don't know, and you're uncertain. But Paul, he is able to have this confidence that that God is going to be good out of all of this. He says this. He says, he says, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed. He's like, even though what I'm going through right now might look bad, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I'm locked up. And I've been locked up once before and the shackles fell off of me at midnight as I was praying. But I've been praying, I've been praising, and the shackles haven't fell off of me now. And, and, and y'all probably wondering, why is the apostle of Jesus, why Jesus not doing something about this? Why? Jesus, you could, you, you've shown us that you could do it before. Why aren't you doing it right now? Paul is saying, listen, even though I, I don't know how it's going to end, I know I'm not going to be ashamed after it's all said and done. That's the confidence that he has in his God. He says, one way or another, God's going to get the glory out of this. God is going to be honored in my body. One way, somehow, some way, we're going to make it. I don't know how, but I just know I have confidence, and I've seen God do so much. I've seen him do too much. I've, I've heard about what he has done that I can't, I can't doubt God now. Uh, he's brought me too far to leave me. I've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's, he's never failed me yet. Oh, 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 I can't turn around. He's brought me this far by faith. He, he does not know how it's going to end. Listen, y'all, to verse number 20. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. See, Paul is in the midst of a turbulent, difficult situation. And he doesn't know how it's going to end, 
But yet he's still confident enough. He still has enough righteous indignation to rejoice in the midst of all of the turbulence that's going on. It's like that little boy who was flying on a plane one day and he was sitting next to this old lady. And um, uh, as the plane started, started flying, they started hitting all this turbulence. I mean, the plane was dropping and, and the, the stuff was falling down from the ceiling. And, and this lady, she was panicking. And as she was panicking, just, just praying, God, save my life, just keep us. The little boy that she was next, sitting next to, he was just playing around with his stuff. He was laughing and just all joyful. And she was looking at him like, how is he able to do this? And so she's still panicking. She's praying, God, save us. Please don't let this plane go down. Anybody ever been there before? I have. God, please, please just let this plane get down safe. And, and she finally had enough of this little boy. She looked to the little boy. She said, would you please stop? Stop having so much fun. How can you have fun when this plane is going through this? The little boy put his hand on the lady's hand. He said, lady, my daddy is the pilot. And when your daddy is the pilot, you can handle the turbulence because you know he's got it all under control. Somebody needs to know that. I know it feels rough right now. I know it feels like stuff is falling and stuff falling out the sky and everything just feels so turbulent, but your daddy is the pilot. And you may not know how you're going to get through this turbulent situation, but as long as you know your daddy's the pilot, you can, you can, matter of fact, you can play and have fun and rejoice and laugh and enjoy yourself because your daddy is the pilot. The deliverance that Paul speaks about, about is a deliverance that he will experience no matter what happens to him in prison. No matter what happens to him after this prison stint, he knows he is going to be delivered. And his expectation is, and his hope is because people have been praying for him, but it is remarkable that he is facing what might be death and still rejoicing. That should be confounding to you and I, but it really shouldn't for those who are believers in Christ, because the second thing that we see in this passage is that not only is Paul confident about deliverance, but he's also confident about death. And this is where I need to be real pastoral for us, because Paul is not sure if this is going to end in death, but even in pending death can't stop Paul from rejoicing. Yeah, it got quiet right through there because most of us are afraid of death. But the only people that have anything to be afraid of in death are the people who do not know what's going to happen after death. But if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you know that he has rescued your life. You know that death is not final. I know that we are in a world where we see death in such a way where it is this grim reaper. And it's not that it's something good to look forward to uh, or maybe not. It, it, but it's not something that we should take lightly. But listen, if you know that Christ died to save you, it says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So you know that not even death is final. Matter of fact, death has lost its sting when Jesus got up out of the grave. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You no longer have victory over me because it's no longer final if I am in Jesus Christ. See, Paul is confident about death. For Paul, death is even a deliverance. It is something that he does not have to be afraid of. Paul is actually clear that death is to be preferred. I wish I would have had more amens, and I know this is tough preaching, but this is the truth of God's word. Let me show you what he says, y'all. The famous verse that so many of us quote, for to me, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
Do y'all hear what Paul is saying there? Do you hear the confidence that he has about death? He's not afraid of death because he's saying, listen, for me to live is Christ. That's wonderful. But if I die, that's going to be me gaining something. Look, he, 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 he says it a, a little bit better um, down in verse number 22. He says, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. He is not being um, 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 just morbid. He, he's not even, as some people suggest, like he's having suicidal thoughts. No, 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 no. He's just like death. You, you're trying to scare me right now, but you ain't, you, I don't have nothing to be scared of when it comes to you, death. Because I know what happens on the other side of this. The only people who should fear death are those who have something to fear after death. If you have not trusted and placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation of your soul, you have something to fear after death. You are facing uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen after death. But those of us who have placed faith in Jesus Christ, we know what's going to happen after death. And if that's you today, you've never placed faith in Jesus Christ. You better do it today because it would be a shame to wake up and find yourself burning in hell for eternity. But we can have confidence. We can have assurance that even death does not have the final say. I read a few months ago, how pastors, one of our responsibilities is to prepare our congregation for death. It is that we would die well. It is that we would not see death as the ultimate final say, but that we know that we have victory over death because Jesus Christ got up out of the grave, and now we will follow him in the same way when he comes to return to receive us back to to him. Gardner Taylor preacher that I tell you all about, one of my, the favorite, my favorite preacher ever, he would say when we met with him in North Carolina, he, he said he was in his 90s at that time, he says he goes to sleep every night hoping that when he wakes up in the morning and opens his eyes, he would be in the bosom of Jesus Christ. He did not fear death, and he went to be with the Lord on Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> Listen, that's why Larry King Y'all remember the old um, CNN guy, Larry King? That's why his words are are so ominous to us. He was interviewed by Barbara Walters, and as she was interviewing him, she, she asked him this question, what's your greatest fear? He immediately replied, death. She said, well, do you believe in God? He says, no, I'm agnostic. He said, but regardless of our success or our status, If we're uncertain about God, we will most assuredly be fearful of death. This is what an agnostic said, Larry King. Easter reminds us that the fear of death dissolves when we walk with the one who walked out of the tomb. An agnostic said that, that Easter reminds us that the fear of death dissolves when Jesus walked out of the tomb. That is the assurance that we have, is that death no longer has the final say. 1 John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. I just want to help ignite your faith with God's word. Second Corinthians 5 and 8 says, we are confident. Yes, we are well pleased. Rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Philippians 3.20, later on in Philippians, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, and that by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself, we have the promise of heaven, of experiencing eternity with God, and that's better than this life here on earth. I know it may not feel good, but it's the truth. We need to hear it, that this world does not become our home, that we don't put more into this world than we should, that we have another home awaiting for us. What does Paul say over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? You only hear it at funerals, but um, you need to hear it on a Sunday morning too. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have 
no hope. For we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring him with those who fall asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord, and therefore we should comfort one another with these words. Listen, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. I, I, I just, I, I know it's not easy preaching, but, but I, I need to remind you, you, you better be prepared for death. You better be serious about your walk with Jesus Christ. You, you, what, how in your life are you showing God you trust and depend on him? How do you show him that you believe that he's your savior and he's your Lord and he's the one who has rescued your life. Listen, Paul, he's able to rejoice because he has a confidence even about death. But then the third thing that we see in this passage is that Paul has a confidence about the work that he is yet to do. He's confident that he has work to do, to get done. This is seen here in these last two verses. Verse 25 and verse 26, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul is having this wrestle. He's actually um, lifting up this rhetorical idea. I don't know, should I die and go to heaven with Jesus or should I stay here and it'll be benefit to y'all because I get to help you grow in your faith? He's actually saying, I would rather go to heaven, but... Because I know that God still has work for me to do, I know that God is going to get me delivered out of this prison jail because there's some more work, labor, good things for me to do that will bless you. He says, so that in me, verse, um, 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 verse 25, for your progress in joy in the faith, he knows that what he is yet to do is going to actually benefit these Philippians. This is, this is fascinating because even though Paul would prefer to have died, he's saying, I need to stay here because I got some work in order to benefit you. Paul understood he needed their prayers, but he also understood they needed him. See, there's this interdependence. It is understanding that none of us can do this alone. Even the gifts that you and I have, you know that they're not for us. There's that somebody else would benefit from our gifts. And here is what this passage is teaching us. It is that if you have life in your lungs, it means that you have living for purpose in your body. If you have life in your lungs, you have living in you to live on purpose, to benefit Others, you, you have meaning in your life if you have life in your lungs. Paul is saying, listen, God's going to pull me through this because he's got more that he wants to do through me. And I'm going to be a benefit to you. Our lives here on earth is connected to our usefulness to God here on earth. Our lives here on earth, when we still have breath in our lungs, it's because God still has something more he wants to do in and through you. He wants to use you for some good for someone else. If you have life in your lungs, if you have breath in your lungs, that means that there is still work for you to do. The question is, is are you living on purpose? Does your life have any meaning? We should be trying to figure out how do I use what God has given me to help somebody else out, to bring joy to somebody else, to help disciple somebody else. We are to be mutual gifts to one another. And it will be reason to cause God to get all the glory 
in our lives. When we are used by him and we are a benefit to others, God gets the glory through that. He is the one that we say, your raggedy self for God to use you, that must only be God. Because as Pastor Tanya reminds us week after week, it's not about us. When are you going to use what God has given you? Because he still has life in your lungs. And if he has life in your lungs, that means that he has purpose living in you. Recently, my dad had this um, TL experience. I don't even know what else to call it except for a TL experience. He, um, his, one of his friends um, uh, wanted, wanted to buy uh, a certain kind of car. And um, he was like, oh, well, my friend over here, he, he actually has that car, and he probably needs to get rid of it. And so he tried to make this connection to sell the friend his car. And, uh, and so, so the friend that had the car needed to sell it. He, um, the friend told my dad, he said, when he, um, when he, the last time he had taken it in to get it serviced, the car only had like 10,000, 15,000 miles on it, but it was like 10 years old. And, and it's a type of vehicle, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those you know, high-performing vehicles. And so when he took it in for maintenance, to get an oil change and stuff like that, the, the guy doing the repairs on the car, he said to him, he said, listen, you are going to kill this car if you don't use it. This car was created to be driven wow. and to be driven often and well. He was like, if you don't use it, you're going to drive this car into the ground. It's not going to be worth anything. You're, it's actually going to freeze up because it's not being used. And so my dad said, I got somebody else who wants that car and will use that car. But here's the blessing out of all of it. The person who wants the car and can use the car, he doesn't have anywhere to put it yet. And so the friend lets my father drive it until the other friend gets some um, someplace to actually put the car. And he is benefiting because of these two people who need a car and one is trying to get rid of it. And, but but if they had, he had not used the car, he needed somebody that would use the car. So my dad is using the car. You've seen it driving around. He drives D.C., he drives New York. He's driving everywhere. Because if that car is not used, It'll, it'll freeze up. It won't be any good anymore. Are you using your gift? Are you using what God has given you? What Paul is really lifting up here is, if there's nothing left for me to do, if I'm not doing anything, I might as well die and go to heaven. I might as well just not even do anything more. But Paul is sure that God is going to deliver him because he knows God still has more to do through him. And I want to encourage somebody. God is going to get you through what you're going through. Because he still has more ministry left in you. He still has more purpose left in you. He still has more meaning for your life. There's still somebody who needs to be ministered by you. And when we avail ourselves to God. God gets the glory out of all of it. Paul says that I know that I'm going to remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Listen, when God, when we're using our gifts well, it will give glory to our great God. And who else besides God deserves our praise who else besides God deserves the glory who else besides God deserves all the glory all the praise all the honor will you let your life be such that it gives glory to God because of how he uses you to bless somebody else Will you allow your life, even the difficulty that you have gone through and you wish God would get you out of it, but he's perhaps allowing you to get through it so that he will be you. He will use you to give his name glory. What if Paul, like Pastor Tanya said last week, had decided, I just want to get out of jail. I ain't writing this letter. I'm just going, I'm just going to shut up. My predicament, my situation is just too tough. 
I, I, I can't take this. This is too much for me. What if he had just, we would not have these words to us to encourage us on today. But Paul said, even in this present predicament, I'm going to rejoice and will rejoice because I know that God can get the glory even out of this. Thank you, God, for this time in your word. I thank you for your word. And I pray that as we close this year out, yes, we are in some uncertain situations. We don't know how things are going to play out. We don't know how this diagnosis is going to go. But we know that we, we can be assured of salvation and deliverance. We don't even have to fear death because death itself no longer has the victory. And so would you help us? That what you're bringing us to, to know that you're going to bring us through. And that when we get through it, that we will give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.